In the first few centuries of early Christianity, the world witnessed some of the most gruesome and horrifying persecutions humanity has ever seen. Some of these stories are not meant for children, so viewer discretion is advised. Intertwined in these stories are a few inspiring people who brave these intense tortures, and one story at the end is so intense that even the tormentors felt bad and had to ease up in their plans. If you enjoy raw, inspiring Christian stories, then let's get into today's Fill of the Day. Beginning around 54 AD, after Christianity had seen a sudden explosion in followers, a Roman emperor named Nero was reigning. He was a man of great creativity combined with a vicious temper and extreme cruelty. It was rumored that Nero had a desire to destroy the city of Rome, so he secretly hired men pretending to be drunk and he tasked them with a mission to set the city on fire. The fire burned for about nine days, resulting in two thirds of Rome being destroyed. Just to give you a kind of picture of the man Nero was, he murdered his own mother, exiled his sister to a remote island, left there to die, and when he got into a disagreement with his leading advisor, Seneca, he immediately discharged him and forced him to commit suicide. It is rumored the reason he had two thirds of the city of Rome destroyed was to make room for a new palace he had been fantasizing about for years. Although no one can prove Nero was the instigator to having the city destroyed, what we do know is that Nero had a peculiar group that was growing in size that he could blame. But before we get into the horrific events that transpired under Nero, there's one notable inspiring person whose life was ended by Nero's great persecuting spree. Paul was a Jewish leader that was extremely zealous for his faith. When he was younger, he rose to the top of his class amongst the best of the best students when it came to religious studies. As he got older, he was so keen to uphold his faith and his traditions that when a group of Jesus followers began to undermine everything he believed in, he would stop at nothing to snuff this rumor out that Jesus had risen from the dead. So convinced of his ideas, he would beat, threaten, imprison any followers of Christ he could find. Everything would change for him one day when all of a sudden he encountered the risen Jesus himself. He fell off his chariot and he was blinded by this piercing light and a voice came from heaven and began to speak to him. Realizing he had made a grave mistake, he went from one extreme to the next. And instead of trying to stop Jesus' followers, he was now Christianity's biggest mouthpiece. He couldn't stop talking about what he had seen and heard no matter what obstacle came his way, whether it was beatings, imprisonments, near-death experiences, it looked like nothing could stop him. That was until he went face to face with his biggest obstacle yet, Nero. Nero concocted some of the most brutal ways to end the lives of Christians. After he captured you, he would cut open a dead animal, stuff you inside while you were still alive, sew it back up and have the mangled carcass with you inside thrown to wild dogs who would tear you apart. Nero would host a party, he would haul you out of prison, take your shirt off, cover it completely with stiff wax, place it back onto your body, he would then tie you to a pole in his garden and set you on fire to provide light for his guests at a party. Even though it's hard to know for sure what exactly happened when Paul died, we do have an early source with an account of what happened in the last few days of Paul. So based on that, here's the best recreation we have of how Paul could have fallen into the hands of Nero. Paul had been preaching and converting many people in Rome. In fact, he was even influencing the members of Nero's very own household. Nero's own cupbearer came to listen to Paul. The crowds were so large at the house that Paul was preaching, he had to push his way in just to get a glimpse and hear what he was saying. Even though he was super keen to hear what Paul had said, he just couldn't get past this massive amount of bodies that were just filling this room. So instead, he decided to perch himself in a high open window. As he was listening, people were still trying to squeeze their way in and someone, not realizing he was sitting on the window, accidentally pushed him off and he fell out of the window to his death. Immediately, the people who saw what had happened ran back to Nero to tell him what had happened to his servant. Paul, having encountered this before, calmed everyone down and prayed for him and he miraculously came back to life. And then he sent him back to Nero's house alive. News got back to Nero that his cupbearer was dead, but his other servants came to him and said, he's not dead, in fact, he's standing alive in the other room. Nero became afraid, like, how can he die and now live? He didn't want to go to the other room, but after convincing himself that there was nothing to be afraid of, he went into the other room and he couldn't believe his eyes. There standing before him was a perfectly alive and well cupbearer. So he asked his servant, are you alive? Yes, Caesar. 
I live. How are you alive? The servant hesitated, but inspired by the Holy Spirit, he said, I live because of Christ Jesus, the King of the ages. Nero became troubled and asked the servant, shall he then overthrow all other kingdoms? And the servant boldly said, yes, he will overthrow all kingdoms and he alone shall reign forever. And there shall be no kingdom that shall escape him. Nero, filled with rage, slapped his servant in the face and shouted, are you a soldier of this king? Looking back at Nero, he said, yes, sir, I am for he has raised me from the dead. And at this statement, other men of high rank in Nero's government also said, we too are soldiers of this king. Nero stared blankly at them until rage filled his eyes. He immediately imprisoned them and began subjecting them to extreme tortures. He then commanded his soldiers to find all of these so-called soldiers of this king because every single one of them needed to be destroyed. Among those he captured was the chief soldier himself, Paul. Paul was led into a very beautiful stone courtyard that had bits of gold and carvings lining around the courtyard. There was a group of soldiers and officials that lined around the courtyard on the story above. And front and center in front of Paul on a podium stood Nero. And with Paul stood a bunch of Christians that had been captured with him. Nero could see that Paul was the leader. So he said to him, you are supposedly the great king's chief soldier, and yet you are my prisoner. And you try and sneak into my ranks and corrupt my very own governors and officials in an attempt to steal them out of my province. But Paul, filled with the Spirit, looked up at Nero and said before them all, O oh Caesar, not only out of your province do we try and enlist soldiers, but out of the whole world. For that is my calling, that no man should be refused if they wanted to serve my king. And you too can serve my king if you will repent. It is not wealth or splendor that exists now in this life that will save you, but if you submit your life to my king, you will be saved. Nero fixed his gaze on Paul and he furrowed his brow. Paul continued, and one day he shall fight against this world with fire. Nero cut him off and commanded that all the prisoners to be burned with fire. And then he stared at Paul and he clenched his jaw in anger. He sentenced him to beheading in accordance with the law of the Romans. Paul was then led out to the city. All the while, he didn't stop trying to persuade men to join his kingdom. And there, he was beheaded in accordance with the law of the Romans. He was one of the first apostles to be martyred for his faith. His death, like his life, was a testament to how much one life surrendered to God can change the world. Today, he is remembered as one of the greatest Christian martyrs of all time the next man on our list started turning his martyrdom into a spectacle for the Roman world to celebrate. However, in the midst of this, there was one man who instead of filling the spectators with wicked glee, he instead shocked them and filled them with awe at the courage of the miraculous events that surrounded his execution. We are now in early 162 AD and Emperor Marcus Aurelius was the next to rule over Rome. Marcus's father died when he was three and he was raised by his grandmother. From a young age, he dedicated himself to wrestling and boxing, which then developed into an obsession to learn how to fight in armor, which would later prove useful as emperor because his reign was filled with military conquest. He was fierce and merciless towards Christians because they refused to worship him as emperor, as well as refusing to worship other gods and partake in the sacrifices which were expected of everyone living in the Roman Empire. The things that happened under his rule were so inhumane that onlookers could hardly even watch. They shuddered in horror while witnessing the atrocities before them. On important days such as the Emperor's birthday, it was custom to have a big event in which Christians would be placed in an arena and exposed to a variety of wild and ferocious animals. One notable martyr was that of Polycarp, who was a direct disciple of the Apostle John, who was a direct disciple of Jesus. Polycarp, when he heard of the things happening near him, wanted to remain in the city and encourage his friends, but the majority of people who knew him and loved him urged him to leave the city. After much convincing, he finally decided to listen and he went not that far from the city to a small quiet house in the country. There he spent most of his time praying for all his friends. He also prayed for all the different churches all over the world. And he would pretty much do this every day from early morning all the way to night. It was while he was doing his usual prayers three days before he was going to be arrested that he had a vision. In his vision, his pillow all of a sudden burst into flames and he turned to his friends and he said, hmm, I must be going to be burnt alive. The Roman soldiers had been ordered to look for Polycarp and they weren't giving up their search. So Polycarp ended up fleeing from one farm to another with the Roman soldiers being not that far behind him. When they got there, they found a couple of young boys hiding in the home. They arrested them and after interrogating them under torture, they confessed to the whereabouts of where Polycarp had fled to. 
When they finally reached him, they found him in bed in the attic, and even though he could have attempted to flee again, he just decided, God's will be done. As soon as he heard them arrive, he went down and chatted with them. All the soldiers couldn't believe how old and how calm he was, and they were surprised that the arrest of such a frail 86-year-old man was so urgent. The whole situation was unusually peaceful. Polycarp offered to make them all food, which he gave them as much as they wanted. He then asked if he could have just one last hour in prayer uninterrupted. They looked at each other and they thought, well, it couldn't hurt and it's late already, so what's one more hour gonna hurt? He thanked them and he immediately went to his knees and started praying. All the soldiers, as they heard the fervency of his prayers, began to feel sorry that they were the ones to have to capture such a gentle old man. Polycarp prayed for every person he could possibly remember that he had ever come in contact with, whether great or small. And when he was done, the soldiers arrested him and took him back to the city. When he got there, one of the leading soldiers came out to meet him and they tried to reason with him saying that all he needed to do was say that Caesar is Lord and then it'll all be over. There's no harm in just saying it. Do the little offering of incense and call it a day. But Polycarp just remained silent. And the soldier urged him even more, saying it would save his life, but Polycarp refused. And after gentle persuasion didn't work, he forced him out of the cart and dragged him, hurting his shin, to the arena where he would stand before the governor with thousands of people watching. It was so loud and there was so much cheering that you couldn't even hear the person talking next to you. The governor got everyone to quiet down and he looked down at Polycarp. You're an old man. Have respect for your years. Swear an oath by the luck of Caesar. Admit you are wrong. You and all your Christian friends. Polycarp started to get an angry look on his face. He looked around as everyone roared and cheered. The governor said, take an oath and I will let you go. Go on, despise your Christ. He looked around as people went silent to hear his response. 86 years I have served him and he has never once wronged me. How then can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? The governor then threatened that if he didn't do what he said, he would throw him to the lions. But Polycarp still would not budge. He then said, well, if you think so lightly of the lions, why don't I burn you to death? Polycarp looked up and he answered the governor with full confidence. The fire you threatened me cannot burn for very long, but you are unaware of the flames of future judgment and everlasting torment which is in store for the ungodly. Why do you go on wasting time? Bring out what you have in mind to do. The governor looked dumbfounded and couldn't believe what he was hearing. He then turned to the crowd and yelled, You heard this man? He has admitted that he is a Christian. The whole crowd burst into roaring and cheering and everyone began chanting, Burn him! Burn him! Burn him! They immediately began setting up piles of wood. When the stake was ready, they took off Polycarp's outer clothes and they were about to nail him to the wood when he assured them that he wouldn't move. So they tied him to the wood with rope instead. Before they started the fire, he looked up to the sky and began praying. Just as he finished his prayer, the wood burst into flames as they set it alight. But unbelievably, the whole arena saw a light in the middle of the fire and inside the fire was a hollow chamber, like a wall surrounding him. And Polycarp just stood inside, untouched. Everyone was in awe and amazed at what they were witnessing, but that quickly turned into anger as they realized not even a hair on his body was being burned. So one of the soldiers ran up and pierced him with a sword. Right then, such a great amount of blood came out of him that it put out the fire. Polycarp then slowly passed away, not from the flames, but from the sword. But not satisfied that they couldn't burn him, they then proceeded to destroy his body in the flames like they originally intended. In the end, Polycarp's faith and steadfastness through prayer proved stronger than the flames that consumed his body. His example continues to inspire Christians around the world to remain loving and faithful to God, no matter the cost. The amphitheater became a regular site of all sorts of martyrdom, but this would end for a short time when Emperor Severus stepped onto the scene. He was favorable toward the Christians because it is said that one day when he was lying in his bed near death due to a severe sickness, a Christian had come up to him and prayed for him and at once he was miraculously healed. However, this favor didn't last long because the prejudice and the fury of the Roman citizens began to reign once more. Old redundant laws were now revised and used to persecute the Christians and just like before, the Romans blamed any natural disaster or misfortune on the Christians. It was during this time that a young woman along with her friends would suffer in such a selfless and courageous way that their stories are still inspiring people today. With the growing hostility towards Christians, it wasn't safe to openly practice your faith in public. So many Christians would gather under the cover of night in secret. Meeting together one night were two women, Perpetua 
and Felicity, alongside their pastor Saturus and a few others. Each of them took turns sharing communion in the dimly lit room and together they quietly sang songs, worshipping the Lord. Perpetua was mid nursing her little child when all of a sudden the door burst open. Soldiers began pouring into the room. Immediately the group began to scatter, fleeing out any window they could find. Pushing over furniture as they tried to escape through any back doors, but the soldiers were swift and a number of them were captured. Pastor Saturus managed to escape. The others who were captured begged the soldiers not to hurt Felicity, a slave girl, because she was actually eight months pregnant at the time. Perpetua's father heard about what was happening and he immediately he immediately got on his chariot and rushed under the moonlight and met the soldiers just as they were about to whisk her away. He stood between her and the soldiers and he begged her, please tell these soldiers you are not Christian, that this is all a mistake. Tell them you're not with these criminal slaves. He said this because as far as he knew, being a wealthy Roman and highly respected family in the community, they had never believed in Christianity. But Perpetua, looking at her dad, said, You're wrong, father. I am a Christian. And these aren't just slaves. These are my brothers and sisters. Shocked at her response, he begged the soldiers not to take her away. But ignoring him, they just ripped the baby off Perpetua while she was still nursing, handed it to the father, and immediately dragged them all away off to prison. While in prison, the father met with Perpetua once more, begging her for his sake that she give up this whole charade. But Perpetua, being grieved by her father's request, looked at a vase next to them and said, What do you see over there, father? He looked at it and said, I see a vase. She said, and can it be anything other than a vase? He was confused and said, no, it can't be. It's a vase. She then said, and neither can I be anything but a Christian. At this, her father burst into tears and handed her son back. Overwhelmed by the whole situation, he left and went to the governor by himself to try and resolve matters on his own. Back in the dungeon, Perpetua was filled with anxiety for her little one as she sat in the cold, dark prison cell nursing her baby. It was in this place that she had a dream. In her dream, she saw a thin golden ladder that could only fit one person stretched all the way up to heaven. On the way up, on either side, close to the ladder, she could see every kind of iron weapon. There were swords, lances, hooks, daggers, and if you weren't careful on the way up, any one of these weapons could accidentally attach yourself to the flesh and rip you to pieces. Underneath the ladder was a dragon who tried to scare the climbers from climbing the ladder. And then all of a sudden she saw her pastor, Satyrus, who wasn't with them, climb up the ladder and once up he turned around and said, climb up, I'm waiting for you and be careful of the dragon. She said, in Jesus' name, it will not hurt me. She then stood on his head, climbed up the ladder, and when she reached the top, she was in this immense garden. And in the midst of the garden was a large white-haired man that just looked like a shepherd that was milking sheep. And standing around were thousands of white-robed people. He raised his head and looked at Perpetua. Welcome, my daughter, he said, and called her over and gave her some cheese from the milk he was milking as if it was a piece of cake. She grabbed it and began to eat, and everyone who stood around the shepherd said, Amen! And the voices of everyone were so loud that it startled her awake. And in her mouth was this indescribable sweetness. She then told the other captives about her dream and that's when they all realized they were about to be martyrs and that they could almost taste heaven because it was so close. The Romans weren't allowed to punish women who were pregnant. So if Felicity didn't give birth in prison, her punishment would be delayed and she would have to face the wild animals on her own. Not wanting this to happen, the group decided to pray for her and her baby was miraculously born early and raised by a friend in the faith. Also, just in time, Perpetua's infant ceased nursing and no longer desired feeding in that way. It was soon time to appear before the judge. If they offered incense to the Roman gods and renounced that they were Christians, they would be set free. If not, they would be punished as entertainment in the amphitheater. Each prisoner stood before the judge and all of them remained steadfast, not renouncing their faith. Her father, seeing that Perpetua was next, begged her, please, for the sake of your son and for the sake of your family, just offer the sacrifices and renounce your Christian religion. She handed him her baby and said, I can't, I will not offer the sacrifice. Her father sobbed and begged her. The guards immediately separated them and beat her father to the ground. She wept over her father as she didn't want him to get hurt because of her. She turned toward the judge and he asked, are you a Christian? With tears in her eyes and bold defiance, she said, I am a Christian. Right there and then, someone pushed through the crowd and looked the emperor in the eyes and said with a loud voice, I too am a Christian. The governor being confused said, who are you? It was none other than Pastor Satyrus. He joined them to help comfort them in suffering and to help them get through their darkest hour. 
He himself said that there's no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. They were all condemned in order to be killed by wild beasts for the enjoyment of the crowd on the next pagan holiday, which happened to be the emperor's birthday. The night before their execution, they all discussed the ways in which they wanted to die. Satyrus didn't want to die by just any wild animal, but asked that he would die with just one bite of the leopard. And when they went to sleep, they all dreamed dreams about their martyrdoms and woke up with an inexpressible joy as heaven just seemed so close. The moment finally arrived and the crowd was roaring as the group walked out into the amphitheater. All their faces were full of joy and without fear. Perpetua sang psalms as they walked, and when they reached the center and came in view of the emperor, Satyrus yelled out, you judge us in here, but in the end, God will judge you. At this, the crowd booed and yelled and demanded that they be whipped and scourged as speaking out against the emperor. They were placed back in their cells and the men and women were brought out separately. Citrus and the men were first and a wild boar was let loose on him but instead of running toward him it went back to his handler, gored him and killed him. And when they tried to let loose the bear it just sat in his den and it wouldn't budge. So he was put away in the cell for a time because the animals just wouldn't touch him. A raving bull was arranged for the woman. They were stripped naked, hung in nets and brought out. But when the crowd saw Perpetua's delicate frame and Felicity who's still leaking from her recent childbirth, they felt bad and urged the soldiers to reclothe them and bring them back out. Perpetua was tossed about by a mad bull and was stunned but not seriously hurt. When she saw her clothes had torn from her side, she quickly covered herself, caring more about her modesty than her suffering. She stood up and fixed her hair because she didn't want to stand before Jesus and appear as if she was mourning. She wanted to go to him proper and filled with joy. Felicity, however, was badly gored, so Perpetua ran to her side and held her while they waited for the bull to come charge them again. But the bull refused to do so, and so the soldiers dragged them from the arena, much to the crowd's disappointment. When she was on the side, as if she arose from her sleep and filled with, in a state of like ecstasy, she said, I cannot tell you when we're going to be led out to that bull. And the other said, Perpetua, you've already been out there. She didn't believe them at first, but when she looked around and she looked at her injuries and her clothes, she realized that she had felt no pain. She began to encourage everyone around her to stand strong and not be discouraged by her sufferings. Satyrus was brought out again and he said to the soldier leading him out, just as I have promised and foretold, leading up to now, no animal has come near. So now believe with your whole heart. Watch, as soon as the animals are brought out, you will see I will die with just one bite of the leopard. And immediately, right at the end of the exhibition, he was thrown to the leopard and with one bite, he died. They brought his lifeless body to where the others would be slaughtered and he was the first to ascend up the ladder to heaven. After a short time, the girls were brought back out to be killed by the gladiators. Felicity was killed quickly with the sword, but the young, inexperienced gladiator who was tasked with killing Perpetua trembled violently and he could only stab her weakly several times around her body. Seeing how he trembled, Perpetua held his sword and guided it to a vital area in the body, thus laying her life down for the sake of her faith. The Roman authorities thought that the spectacle of death would only discourage the believers, but they were wrong. The courage of Perpetua, Felicity, and Satyrus only served as seeds for growth of the church, and many people became believers. Her writing is one of the earliest writings ever from a Christian woman, and it shows her desire to make Christ known even after her death. The Roman emperors were right in that the Christian faith was a direct threat to Rome. It would actually be through these martyrs and miraculous events that the Roman emperors themselves would eventually become Christians. Thus, Rome and its customs would forever change as it became a Christian nation. I have hidden the like and subscribe button somewhere on the slides of this video, so comment below with a timestamp if you found them. Also, a special thanks to those who support me on Patreon to ensure that content like this continues to inspire people all around the world to stand strong in the midst of persecution. You can also help support the channel by buying some merch. Link is in the description.